Welcome to Psychological Explorations with Dr. Michael Axelman. And Daniela. Today we're going to be exploring a, a wonderful book. I mean, it's just a gem from a British, a kind of philosophical writer who wrote at the, uh, the turn of the century, 1902. This book was published, As a Man Thinketh. And James Allen was kind of the, the self-help guru of his time, where he wrote books about proper living, proper achieving, and proper thinking is what's addressed in, in the book today, As a Man Thinketh, which came out in 1902 uh, and 1903. It was circulated more broadly. The book focuses on how thought influences life more generally. And the very first chapter is on thought and character. And I quote the aphorism, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, not only embraces the whole of man's being, but is so comprehensive as to reach out to every condition and circumstance of his life. A man is literally what he thinks, his character being the complete of all his thoughts. Act is the blossom of thought, and joy and suffering are its fruits. Thus does a man garner in the sweet and bitter fruitage of his own husbandry. Man is the master of thought, the molder of character, and the maker and shaper of condition, environment, and destiny. As we move from thought and character, we're going to explore the influences of thought on other aspects of living. The effect of thought on circumstances. What a brilliant insight that man is the master gardener of his soul. Keeping it free from weeds and growing the flowers and fruits which he requires. So may a man tend the garden of his mind, weeding out all the wrong, useless and impure thoughts and cultivating towards perfection the flowers and fruits of right, useful and pure thoughts. Thought and character are one, and as character can only manifest and discover itself through environment and circumstance, the outer conditions to a person's life will always be found to be harmoniously related to his inner state. He realizes he is a creative power and that he may command the hidden soil and seeds of his being out of which circumstances grow. He then becomes the rightful master of himself. Circumstance does not make the man. It reveals him to himself. Very profound. Circumstance does not make the man. It reveals him to himself. Alan brings us to this place of self-observation, self-awareness of how our thoughts are moving moment to moment and how to become aware and then move into correction, self-correction in real time.
the effect of thought on health and the body. Society quickly demoralizes the whole body and lays it open to the entrance of disease. Strong, pure, and happy thoughts build up the body in vigor and health. Thoughts of malice, envy, disappointment, despondency rob the body of its health and grace. I know a man well below middle age whose face is drawn into inharmonious contours. There is no physician like cheerful thought for dissipating the ills of the body. The physician of cheerfulness and how it impacts health more generally. Very important insights. How to correct thinking and start thinking of yourself as vital, healthy, youthful, energetic, resilient. The types of thought that promote well-being, the physical body. The connection Alan makes between thought and purpose, the exercise of right thinking. Until the thought is linked with purpose, there is no intelligent accomplishment. A man should conceive of a legitimate purpose in his heart and set out to accomplish it. He should make this purpose his extreme duty, not allowing his thoughts to wander away into ephemeral fancies, longings, and imaginings. This is the royal road to self-control and true concentration of thought. Thought allied fearlessly to purpose becomes creative force. Thought allied fearlessly to purpose becomes creative force. What's my purpose? What's my focus? And how to move into purposeful living. It may be that you define yourself by a certain set of behaviors, values. And it's through these values that our life gains purpose. The thought factor in achievement more generally. All then a man achieves and all that he fails to achieve is the direct result of his own thoughts. As he thinks, so he is. As he continues to think, so he remains. At the higher he lifts his thoughts, the more manly, upright, and righteous he becomes, the greater will be his success. The more blessed and enduring will be his achievements. He who would attain highly must sacrifice greatly. He who would attain highly must sacrifice greatly achievement and sacrifice so many try to bypass the sacrificial aspect of achievement it's a central ingredient here right the thought factor in achievement 
is that persistence. We move now to some of the, the factors that influence successful thinking. Visions and ideals. Dream lofty dreams, and as you dream, so shall you become. Vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. Your ideal is the prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. Whatever your present environment may be, you will fall, remain, or rise with your thoughts, your vision, your ideal. Gifts, powers, material, intellectual and spiritual possessions are the fruits of effort. They are thoughts completed, objects accomplished, visions realized. This is very important to understand that your own gifts and powers, your intellectual and spiritual possessions are the fruits of effort. And included in these are material aspects. And as such, they are thoughts completed. Yeah, see if you can really hold and meditate on this connection. And we close today with serenity. So simple and so profound. Calmness of mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom. The more tranquil a man becomes, the greater is his success, his influence, his power for good. The exquisite poise of character, which we call serenity, is the last lesson of culture, the fruitage of the soul. Self-control is strength. Right thought is mastery. Calmness is power. Calmness is power. Daniela, I'm interested in your thoughts and reactions to yes. James Allen today. Yes, it reminds me of the first time you had me read On Dialogue. <clears throat> I was kind of blown away with on dialogue by David Bohm, and I felt similarly to this this piece as well. I've listened to it twice on audiobook. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, as I think about the the more tranquil a man becomes, the greater his success, his influence, his power for good. Um, immediately, a few people came to mind, and those are people that I have met in my position in leadership, and it seems to me that. The ones, like my direct boss, Mac, um, even sometimes I'll come to him with situations at work that are very difficult and I'm triggered or I feel personal about it. And he's so tranquil about it. And he's had a great success in his life. Um, and uh, it's the same with some other leaders like you and another person that I work with um, who's retired now but was a, a, a pretty big leader in the Bay Area. Um, all of them are just tranquil. 
they don't get reactive they don't get upset and that's where i think really where i'm i'm trying to go so it's like the self control is strength the calmness is power um it's, i feel like it's going to be a mantra but also something that i can use with clients too <laughs> you know uh but there's a lot of things that stood out to me here so i'm thinking michael um uh, I think there's two ways that I'm thinking about this. One is clinically, how to incorporate this clinically um, with clients and whatnot. And then the other is uh, how to use this as a way of uh, personal development, which I think they both kind of mm -hmm. align, you know, the, the uh, I've told, Absolutely. been told this. Yes. You've told me this. Other people have told me this, uh, that you can only take your clients as far as you've gone. Are you still there? Oh, I am. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm having a little bit of connectivity issues. Um, That's okay. Um, you know. Did Did yeah. you ask a question? I, I I did, and I just think I left it at that statement of uh, you can only take your clients as far as you've gone, and mm -hmm. you've told me this, mm -hmm. but other I think other yes. clinicians that I I feel have been doing this work for decades that are very wise that I've worked with have also had similar sentiments and similar beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Well, I think it's similar with parents and children. I mean, I think any kind of exemplar or leader can only take people as far as they've gone. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and here we're, we're moving into thinking about thinking yes. right which is <laughs> not not something everybody does am i thinking about this the right way what would be a better way of thinking about this mm -hmm. right once you move into that place right where you're trying to improve develop make yourself a better one today than you were yesterday and that would be linked with purpose, right? Having that purpose mm -hmm. to become the best person that you you could be. Be the person that you're truly meant to be. Oh, yeah. It's like the, you know, the Winnicottian, the true self, the false self. You know, yes. there were two things that really stuck out to me that I, I want to explore with you a little bit more in this work is... Um, at one point in the, the book, he says, a man attracts not what he wants, but what he is. And then I'm sort of connecting that to circumstances do not make the man right. It reveals him to himself. Um, yes. Yes. I think those are two very interesting points here. And I think that they're kind of connected. Um, you know, the, particularly the man attracts not what he wants, but what he is. Um, this is. I think really interesting when you think of, uh, I work with young adults and mm -hmm. one of the big things that occurs with young adults is tumultuous relationships, especially in the communities that I work in. Mm -hmm. A lot of, a lot of the yes. clients that I work with come from mm -hmm. dysfunctional homes, yeah. alcoholism, these kinds of things. And so they end up in these relationships and they're telling me what they want in a relationship and their actual relationship is sort is nothing like what they want um oh so exactly right just stick out to yes me. of what they say that they want yes yes yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah how do you work yeah. with clients like um you know this is me sort of asking you clinically as well yes um, well it's inviting somebody into that position of taking responsibility for all aspects of their life and to not use the therapeutic time of coming in and just talking about other people <laughs> who serve as serve as impediments yeah um yes yeah, some people choose to use therapy to report on all of the people in their life who act poorly oh yeah right, yeah. right? and that fills their day and it fills their mind um, with very little incorporation of what part of this is mine. Yep. 
Yeah. Yes, um, absolutely. And I have found, because I, you know, work with young adults and I've worked with some young adults for years. I've worked with them since they were teenagers. Um, and when you begin to sort of push a little bit on that, they become angry. Mm -hmm. um, but that's in, in my sort of clinical work with them. It's really an opening. It's really a, a place for us to actually be in relationship with each other way they become, you know, I, I had a client just the other day when mm -hmm. I was kind of doing this say to me, um, you know, I just feel like you're not on my side and I should be able to come to therapy and just vent and you should accept everything that I say. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it was a real, I think, beautiful moment for us in that um, I was able to acknowledge, you know, her, her need and also acknowledge that I, in fact, I am on her side. Mm -hmm. And part of being on her side is helping her look at all aspects of herself, even when they're not pleasant. And that's how we grow. That's how we sort of make progress. And um, I just kind of aligned it to some of her, her goals for therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd say in our next session, it was very different and things have been moving in a very good direction. And this is a client that I've consulted with you many times um, that has been actually quite challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think the big piece for this client too is that a lot of people are scared of her. And when I went into that, I wasn't scared of her. Um, and there was both an anger, but also a containment and like mm -hmm. a, an acknowledgement of like, I'm not scared and I can push back and I can hold you and I can work with you on looking at what's actually going on here. Yes. Yes. You give real feedback in a safe environment. Yes. Right. Because it's, it's a classic, you know, uh, attracting, you know, the things that you say, not attracting the things that you say that you want, but mm -hmm. attracting what's actually, you know, there, chaos and unpredictability yes. and all those things, you mm -hmm. know, so. Well, that's that familiar aspect that gets repeated through the traumas. Yes. Right. Um, that's part of that repetition compulsion. compulsion. Mm -hmm. The trauma, the agitation, irritability, that whole complex of revisiting that state mm -hmm. very mechanically, right? Without even thinking it through, it just kind of overwhelms the system. Yes. Um, Absolutely. Um. So when closing, Danielle, I know you had some thoughts about actually applying this to your own life on a daily basis. Yes. But maybe you could share <laughs> a little bit of that and then we'll, um, we'll move towards our close yes. today. Thank you. Yes. So um, one of the things that was most impactful to me about this, this piece was, like you said, it's simple, but it's profound. And so I was telling Michael earlier today that I'm thinking about incorporating into like a daily meditation slash ritual um, to get the day started off rather than, you know, doing some of the other things that I usually do. Because I think um, if I listen to what he's saying, dreams are the seedlings of reality. If you have a vision, you'll make it happen as long as you carry it in your mind. Um, that I would really like to incorporate this more into sort of some of my daily practice and it's something that I'm also going to share with a lot of my interns and supervisees um, to help them really think through the self-care piece and the self-reflection piece that's required, and the type of work that we do as therapists. So I really like that we read this, Michael, and mm -hmm. I appreciate the recommendation, and I'm glad we were able to talk about it today. Thank you, Daniela, and thank you for joining us today. Please come back and join us for future podcasts, Psychological Explorations. Thank you.